Hello, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Would you please join us as we sing our gathering song, which is coming on the screen. Welcome, everybody, to Apison Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you say amen if you're excited to be here today? Amen. amen. I know I'm really excited, excited to be with you all um, for this worship service. Um, now it is time for our announcements, and I'd like to start with an announcement for this, or for last week. Raise your hand if you were here for volleyball on Sunday, last Sunday. Okay, it was loads of fun. Uh, we took a picture, um, and we plan on sharing it. We'll have to share it with you guys one day. But it was really fun. So if you guys play volleyball, um, on Sundays, we're going to try to do a volleyball uh, thing at 10 a.m. Not this Sunday, because Jason and I are going to be gone. But the following Sunday, next Sunday, we're going to do volleyball at 10 a.m. at the school gym. And so it was really fun last time. You guys who are here, you know that it was a good time, so invite your friends. And also on Wednesday... Raise your hand if you were here for Wednesday, the Wednesday night soccer and worship. Okay, some of you guys. Also, that, it was a blessing. A lot of young people showed up, a lot of kids. And so if you want to come and support the young people, if you want to come and just build relationships with them, we encourage you guys to come on Wednesday, Wednesday night. Um, this Wednesday, we're going to do it again. It's going to be at 6, um, 6 o'clock p.m. We'll do worship at 630 and then we'll do soccer at 7. So if you just come at 6.30 Wednesday, 6.30 on Wednesday, um, come hang out with the kids and have some watermelon, some popcorn. We're going to spend some time in the gym, and then we'll go out to play soccer um, at 7, just to be cool, because it's really hot outside. All right, are there any other announcements? All righty, now... We're going to do um, some praise music. And you guys can feel free to sing as well. If you know the lyrics, if you know the songs, join us as we play these songs. I don't want to 
I think I may never understand That my broken heart is a part of your plan When I try to pray God has heard and these four words Thy will be done Thy will be done so 
Now, would you like to join us for our theme song for today? Another six days' work is done. You guys want to join us again? <laughs> Another six days' work is done. And do we have an organist for this one? <laughs> Could we? <laughs> would you do the honors?
Now we're going to do our affirmation, which is in Exodus 28, verse 11. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor the cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Now please join us as we sing Sanctuary, and you can reverently kneel if you're able. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness this morning. We thank you for your awesome majesty. And right now, we, we ask for a shield wall of angels around this place. We claim it as an embassy of the kingdom of heaven and not of a part of this world. We pray that your angels and your spirit would be present and do a work in us. Oh Lord, in your presence now, we confess our utter sinfulness. And we confess the times this week when we have not always done what we should have done. But we are thankful for we know that there is forgiveness with you. We thank you for your promise that if we would confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so now we pray that coming here, being bathed in your spirit, that you would give us strength and ennoble us to live for you. May your word be heard and may this worship be pleasing in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God's plan for the salvation of humanity is not an afterthought. The Bible says that Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. This clearly illustrates the consideration of a loving God for fallen humanity. But is your worship an approach to God's instructions led by second thoughts? In response to the example set by the greatest giver, the Apostle Paul admonished the believers in Corinth to also plan their giving. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. Giving that is planned honors the receiver. Think about your feelings when you receive a belated birthday note from someone you consider close and important to you. It's an awkward feeling, isn't it? Sometimes the message comes when they see your social media post thanking others for their well wishes. These belated notes are rarely the most valued. This happens because we want to show someone that they count and are special. We usually mark our calendar and even add a reminder for us not to miss the opportunity to demonstrate it. The best expression of love is both spontaneous and planned. What type of giver are we when we express love and thanks to God? 
Do we depend solely on the prompting of our impulses and feelings? Do we ask the deacon to wait while we dig deep into our purse or pocket? Or do we remember about returning tithe and giving regular and systematic offerings every time we see an expectedly higher balance on our bank statement at the end of the month? How do we honor the Savior who does not treat us as an afterthought? As we worship God with our tithe and promise, let us show that our God is first and foremost. May we put our desires last and God first. So it is now time for offering. Offering this week is for local church budget. And as I just see here on the back of my bulletin, there's a nice little graphic on the bottom. Um, next to the building goal, it talks about the financial update. We've got a monthly budget. And as I glance at it, I see that it's a little behind. And to me personally, that's motivating. Um, to some people, it might be a little dejecting. I know that as every month goes by, you fall further behind. I can feel even more, I guess, dejecting. If I think about my bank balance over the years, I've definitely had some periods of time where I've felt, okay, this is getting out of hand. <laughs> but this week, interesting, this week I had a, an interesting thought. For whatever reason, the, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 popped into my head. Um, and I just got to thinking that the boy that brought his five loaves and two fishes, he had no idea whose offering was going to make all the difference. Like, he just thought, I just want to make a difference. I want to just give some little thing to make a little impact. And lo and behold, God used it to feed everyone. So may our offering just be our little five loaves and two fishes or, you know, whatever it can be, just to make a difference and God will bless it. So let's bow our heads and pray for that. The deacons want to stand as we get ready. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, just please accept our offering here that we give today and those offerings given online, scheduled, pledged. Um, just use it for your will and may you multiply it and help it grow. In your name, amen. Time for our children to collect an offering to help the students at our school.
I want to, but, but I'm scared. I'm scared, but I really want to. I've always wanted to since I've been big, but I'm just scared. Oh, come on, Brenda, you can do it. Go with us. Go with us. Okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to climb that cliff. And Brenda had always wanted to climb that rocky cliff, but she was scared because she'd never done it before. She'd never done it before, and she was afraid. But she got all ready to go with her friends when the day came, and they went to the bottom of that cliff, and Brenda looked up, 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 up. Wow, that was straight up. And there were just, every once in a while, there'd be a little place that you could put your hand, a little tiny outgrowing of rock that she could see. And they said, now there's going to be someone with a rope at the top, and they're going to help us if we need it so we don't fall. So you don't have to worry, but watch your step. Oh, Brenda was excited, and she was scared. But she said, I wanted to do this. I know I can do this. I'm going to do this. And so she started up that rock cliff. And she, every time her fingers could find a little tiny place to hold on, she held on. She held on for dear life. And her feet were climbing and her hands were climbing. And up the cliff she went. And finally she got to a place where her hand would fit really nicely on the, on the edge of the rock. And she stopped. But just about that time, the person at the top of the rock, they accidentally kind of snapped the rope and it hit her right in the face. And when it did, it knocked out one of her contact lenses. It, went, it came right out of her eye. And she goes, oh, my, my contact lens. And she's looking, where could it be? And she's looking on the little ledge and it's not there. And she's going, it's gone. And she looked up, up, up at maybe a hundred feet. And she looked down, down, down at maybe more than a hundred feet. And she said, where's my contact? And everything was blurry in that eye. She couldn't see very well. But it was time to climb. So she climbed up, up, up that side of that cliff but she was worried. She was far from home. There was nowhere to get another contact. And here she was, blurry-eyed and halfway up a mountain. Well, she got to the top of the mountain, and when she got there, she turned around to wait with the others, for the others that were coming up the mountain. And she looked, and there were rolling mountains and high mountains, trees everywhere, and the thought came to her, Aren't you glad God gives us thoughts? Yeah. The thought came to her, God knows every leaf on every tree that you're looking at. He knows every little stone on this mountain, and he knows where your contact is. She said, well, maybe I'll get one of my friends. Just look at me. Is it in my eye? And the friend looked, and she said, no, it's not there. She said, is it stuck on my clothes? And the friend looked, and she said, no, Brenda, it's not there. Okay. Finally, the last person made it up the side of that mountain, and they were ready to take the trail now and walk down to the bottom. And as Brenda stood up, she said, dear Jesus, you know exactly where my contact is. You know I need it. And you know where it is. And I, please, Jesus, please help me find my contact. <laughs> so down the trail they go. And as they get to the bottom of the hill, would you believe it? Here's a whole bunch of people getting ready to go up that mountain. They're getting ready to climb the mountain that she had just climbed. And so one of them starts up and goes, hey, guys, anybody lose a contact? <laughs> She held up a contact, and Brenda said, I know it's mine. It's my contact. She went and got it, and the girl said, do you know how I found this contact? And she said, no, how? She said, well, I was just getting ready to put my hand on this little rock, 
and there was an ant walking across the rock carrying your contact lid. <laughs> oh no! What do you think that ant felt like when God said, I want you to carry this contact? It's, I can't eat it. It's heavy. But if you want me to carry it, I'll carry it. There he went, carrying the contact right across the ledge. Brenda was so happy. She was so happy. Our God is how big? He is so much bigger than we even know. He is a mighty God. Sometimes, do you have something to do that's just too hard for you? And you think, oh, they've asked me to do it, but I can't. It's too hard. If God can help an ant carry a contact lens that had fallen from hundreds of feet down to wherever that little ant, or maybe God made the ant carry the contact, I don't know. But if God can do that for an ant, can he do that for us? Is he our helper? Amen. Can we bow our head just a minute? Jesus, thank you so much for giving us a chance to know you, our strong helper. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, and thank you so much for loving us, God. We love you, too. Help us to be strong and do the work you have for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, go very quietly back to your seats, okay? Dads are special. They're a daughter's first love and a son's first hero. They rocked us in their strong arms when we were babies, held our small hands on the first day of school, and blinked back tears when they let us go after dropping us off at college or walking us down the aisle. So much of who we are and who we will become is because of Dad. His impact will last as long as we live. It's hard to be a good dad, so this Father's Day be thankful for yours squeeze his hand or give him a call just to tell him thanks to tell him you love him to tell him you're glad that he's your dad today's scripture reading is Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day for rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Amen. Good morning.
joy of knowing Jesus saved me. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Ada, for that fresh, uh, Aida, sorry, for that fresh uh, Bible reading. And thank you, teacher Janet, for allowing me to think about how an ant might bring me my la lost contact. God is very good. Let's see, I'm looking for the clicker this morning, and I don't see it. I don't know if someone knows where it is. She could bring it to me. Yeah, it's not up here. But while they're working on that, let's pray one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us to your house of worship. Thank you for the beautiful worship we've experienced this morning. And we pray that as we open your word, as we linger a little bit longer, uh, that your message would be heard. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you go to the next slide, just five months ago, if you were shown a picture of this flag, it would probably have meant very little to you. Chances are you would have not been able to identify the country it was from or where it's located on a map. But today, most Americans can recognize the Ukrainian flag. Thank you. Let's see. Now let's see if it'll work. Oh, one moment. Okay, most Americans can recognize the Ukrainian flag in a heartbeat. Ever since the Russian invasion, the flag has become instantly recognizable. Has anybody seen the Ukrainian flag out and around town? Um, it's been incredible. I was driving down Lee Highway, and I was passing this place where they were selling flags, and usually it's like Confederate flags and, and, uh, and Tea Party flags, but this time it was just painted the whole thing of Ukrainian flags. To be sure, we've also become acquainted with Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky. He's been relentless in asking for support from nations all over the world via the wonders of modern technology. He's been in front of the US Congress and in front of the UK Parliament and in front of the European Union. And it's been interesting to listen to how Zelensky talks about his flag. To the Swedish government, Zelensky declared, the blue and yellow flag is the symbol of freedom. Zelensky has argued the whole world should care very much about the survival of Ukraine because they're not just fighting for themselves, but for all those who value freedom. And perhaps this is why we're flying the Ukrainian flag in America today, because our hearts resonate with the people searching for freedom. We fly the flag not because we like the color or because we're Ukrainian by birth, but because we identify with what the flag stands for, namely freedom. Now let me ask you a question. Does God have a flag? A flag marking freedom in Christ? Is there any experience shared by God's people down through the ages which reminds them that they have been saved and sanctified only by the all-sufficient power and grace of God? Is there any sign given by the Creator God to stake His claim as the only one who saves? Does God have a flag of freedom. In 2013, my wife and I took part in an Old Testament study tour. We found ourselves in the city of Jerusalem on Friday evening. From our hotel, we took the elevator down, and to our surprise, it stopped on every floor so that no one would have to press a button and break the Sabbath. As we made our ways out onto the streets amid the twilight sky, we saw a world of contrasts. On the one hand, cars zooming by, and on the other, large groups of Jews, dressed in their finest, huddled toward the city center. Inside the city walls of Jerusalem and onto the hollowed grounds, we observed all the shops were closed and boarded up. Soldiers patrolled the winding passageways with sophisticated weaponry to ensure law and order. The city was ready to keep the Sabbath. All traffic on the walkways at that time was leading to one point. Everyone in the city was going there, the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall, despite how we called it in college, is not the place where the grades are posted in the religion department. But the Wailing Wall is the support wall of the Temple Mount. And on most occasions, you can find the Jewish people lined up there crying and praying and begging God for reversal of their fortunes and for a rebuilt temple. But on Friday night, as the Sabbath begins, the Wailing Wall is turned into a place of ecstatic joy and celebration. 
As my wife and I arrived at the courtyard, we saw the Wailing Wall in plain view. We saw what looked like hundreds or maybe thousands of people gathered in their best attire, many with scriptures in hand. Some even had pieces of scripture around their forehead, all ready to welcome the Sabbath. Of particular interest to us was a scene we had not anticipated. There was an enclosure that, that blocked off two sections. One was for men, the other was for women. And in each zone, there was great dancing and singing. And we wanted to know what this was all about. Do, this, do they do this every Sabbath, we wondered? And so my wife, who's always been the bolder of the two of us when it comes to interacting with strangers, she found a young man, a Jewish man of Australian nationality. And she asked him, What's going on? Explain this to us. So he explained the attire and the hats and the hairdressings and the scriptures on the forehead. And he explained the enclosures and the dancing and the prayers. Just then, a mother arrived with her two daughters. It quickly became clear that this young man Anna was talking to, he'd actually only been there because he was waiting to meet this young man or to meet the mother and, and her two young daughters. And so, as he began, as she arrived, he began to excuse himself. He said, I'm going to their house for Sabbath dinner. We're going to welcome in the Sabbath. Have a good night. So long. But as he turned to join the mother and the daughters, as if to walk away, my wife was not about to let the intercultural experience pass. So she blurted out after him, we keep the Sabbath too. <laughs> the mother was intrigued. She'd never heard of anyone keeping the Sabbath except for Jews. So... She invited us to join them. We walked across the city and up to their apartment. They must have been fairly wealthy after all. Their apartment was just across the street from the prime minister's residence. They were from South Africa, but they maintained an apartment in Jerusalem for whenever they came to visit. As we gathered around the table to eat the Sabbath meal, one of the daughters finally said, all right, so tell us, why do you keep the Sabbath? We did our best to explain that we were Seventh-day Adventist Christians, but they never heard of Seventh-day Adventists before. They thought we were making something up. They asked, are there more of you people? <laughs> we attempted to explain. We observe the Sabbath because it's a gift of love from God to all mankind from the beginning of creation. We explained that the Sabbath is freedom, freedom to set aside tyranny of deadlines and work and striving and to trust on the God who holds all things in his hands. But I'll never forget their perspective. They said, wow, we thought the Sabbath was a curse just for us. We thought the Sabbath was a burden we alone must carry. They couldn't wrap their minds around why anyone would voluntarily keep the Sabbath. What was to us a joy, to them was a burden. And perhaps it was because they had so many excessive rules heaped on themselves, they could not even take a picture with us for fear that pressing the button on the camera would violate the Sabbath. Still, I couldn't help wonder, did they get it right? They said the Sabbath was a burden. Were they really telling the truth? I, I don't think so. I didn't think so then. I don't think so now. The Sabbath isn't a burden. It's a joy. It isn't restrictive, it's liberating. Could it be they were keeping all the rules, rules, but still missing the essence of the Sabbath? What were they missing that I understood? In a word, they were missing the fact that the Sabbath is about freedom. I'm glad you're back at Apison as we continue our summer sermon series honoring the flag. Today's message is called Freedom in Stone. Last week, we considered the first seven days of creation. We noticed that God set apart the seventh day. He rested on it, blessed it, sanctified it, imbued it with special significance. In fact, we even suggested that the seventh day is God's flag. Just like any flag is special, not because it's made of special fabric, but because of what it stands for, what it represents. So too, the seventh day Sabbath is a moment in time, set apart and blessed because of what it represents to God. Last week, we discovered that from the very beginning, the seventh-day Sabbath represents at least four things. It memorializes God's power at creation. He says, I'm the creator, I created, and this seventh day is to set apart to remember that. It demonstrates his character of love, namely his love for human beings, that he would want to set aside time just to be with us. It reveals his presence, for it was his presence that sanctified and made holy the day. 
and it calls for trust in his word because it's that day and not the third day or the fourth day or the fifth day or any other day, but only the day that he said was special. This morning, we will add one more idea to the portfolio of meanings represented by the seventh day. The seventh day is about freedom in Christ. Allow me to explain. Let's fast forward from the creation account to the time when God's chosen people were slaves in Egypt. We move from Genesis to Exodus where we see the children of Israel are being worked to exhaustion as slaves, but God sends Moses and says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And this will become the refrain throughout the saga. It's God's call for freedom, and he says it over and over and over again in the passage, in the story. You know the story. If you read the narrative, it comes over and over again. Let my people go. Most of us are familiar with how God rained down plagues on Egypt, and eventually Pharaoh let the children of Israel go. But all too often, many of us forget to explore God's motivation in seeking to set his people free. It is important, you see, because this is part of the refrain as well. Repeatedly, God doesn't just say, let my people go. He says, let my people go so that they may worship me. So we discover a battle between God and Satan over the issue of worship. God doesn't free the Israelite slaves only because they're being worked too hard, though they are being worked too hard, but because he longs for a relationship with them. And this is why when the children of Israel are finally set free, God says to Moses in Exodus 19, you've seen what I've done to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God didn't bring the children of Israel out of Egypt so that he could bring them to the promised land. At least that wasn't the primary motivation. The primary motivation was for God to bring a people to himself. After all, these are the children of Abraham who the Bible tells us obeyed God's voice and kept his commandments. God is longing to restore intimacy with this people, and nothing signified the desired relationship more than the seventh-day Sabbath. The Sabbath features in the Exodus story itself. You see, over the course of their slavery in Egypt, the Sabbath had been generally forgotten and disregarded by the Israelites. The Egyptians had made it apparently impossible to keep. But in Exodus 5, Moses arrives and he seemingly restores the Sabbath upon his arrival. Moses makes a request to Pharaoh that the people might stop their labor, go out into the wilderness, and worship God. But Pharaoh objects. He says, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your work. Pharaoh is used to making his slaves work 24-7, and he's not about to give them a break no matter the reason. So Pharaoh continues. He says, look, you make them rest from their labor. And that word rest is that same one when it says God rested on the seventh day. It's Shabbat. Pharaoh says, you make them Sabbath from their labor. Pharaoh rejects their day of rest and instead doubles their workload. And so there's a great controversy over freedom for God's people to worship him with a Sabbath rest. But if in their captivity, the children of Israel are not able to keep the seventh-day Sabbath, freedom from their Egyptian captors changes everything. For as soon as God's people are finally out from under the yoke of Pharaoh, the observance of God's seventh-day Sabbath reappears. Once again, it is directly instituted by God himself. Wandering in the wilderness, the people need to eat. After all, when you go on a trip, how long can you last on granola bars? They've packed some things, but eventually it's wearing out, it's running out, and they need to eat. So the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And God rains down manna from heaven. Manna literally means, what is it? The Israelites themselves weren't quite sure, but it was food, and it sustained them day by day. Following God's instructions, the people went out to collect food for each day's use immediately after the sun came up. But it was carefully pointed out that the manna should be collected each day and for that day only. The Bible says uh, Moses was instructed, let no man leave any of it till the morning. Some, however, did not listen to Moses. They saved the leftovers for the next day. But the manna didn't store well, and by the next morning, it bred worms and became foul. 
So they were only able to gather enough every day for that one day. And this pattern continued for five days. But then on the sixth day, the instructions suddenly changed. The people were notified to gather twice the amount for the next day. So then on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food. Then Moses told them the reason. He said, because tomorrow, the seventh day, is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Six days you shall gather the manna, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. And the people must have wondered, well, what will happen? Will we go hungry? Won't the manna we collect on the sixth day spoil just as it did on all the other days? The next day, however, they were surprised to discover that the manna did not stink or get maggots in it. What a miracle. It defied everything they had experienced before. The manna had always melted and rotted when they tried to store it. For this reason, the manna had to be earned. It had to be worked. Every day it needed to be gathered. And it was logical to expect this pattern to continue. No wonder the text says that on the seventh day, some of them said, hey, the sun's up. We need to keep this pattern up. We need to go out and get the manna. And they went out to gather anyway. They expected to work for their food. I mean, it had only been a week ago that they were slaves in Egypt working 24-7. For their entire lives, the sun coming up another day was only a signal to resume the daily grind. Every day was just another chance to work again. There was no exception, no rest, no break. Does that sound exhausting? Thus, when the first Sabbath day in freedom came, some people still dressed up for work and went out looking for manna. But they found none. Moses explained what was happening. He said, look, see, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. So the people rested on the seventh day. God was obviously teaching the Israelites a lesson, a lesson that was less about manna and more about the Sabbath. In fact, he called it a test. He said, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. In Deuteronomy, Moses explained that the, if, that the uh, Israelites, to the Israelites, that the miracle of the manna came about in order to know what was in their heart. You see, for the first time, these former slaves had freedom. When you have freedom, you have to make a choice about how to use that freedom. Now they had to make a choice about the seventh day. They must choose whether to trust in God's provision for that day or to depend upon their own works. The Sabbath symbolized the right exercise of freedom to depend upon Christ and not upon self. The Sabbath gave them dignity as human beings again. Oh, imagine what Sabbath and a Sabbath rest would have meant to slaves who have spent their entire lives working 24-7 for the Egyptian pharaoh. If you've ever felt you were suffering in your life under the daily grind of responsibilities and things to do, just imagine what a Sabbath rest meant to slaves. In a word, the Sabbath meant freedom. Notice the text says the Sabbath is given to you, not taken away from you. That's because the Sabbath is not a cursed day of obligation, but has always been a day of blessing and freedom. For the Israelites collecting the manna, their needs would be met even if they did not work on that day. And they wouldn't gain anything even if they did work. This people, reared on self-sufficiency and hard labor, were being shown that a higher power was looking after them. They were being taught the meaning of freedom and grace. The opportunity to know God stood at the center of their newfound freedom. And the Sabbath pointed the way. It was the Ellis Island of first impressions, the Statue of Liberty rising out of the fog. For those who were coming out of slavery and wondering what's this new life going to be like, the Sabbath set the tone. It was the gateway to freedom. On the Sabbath, they could get to know the God who had set them free. They were no longer slaves having to work for their Egyptian overlords. Now they were free to think and act for themselves. The neglected flag symbolizing God's character of love was raised again, signaling that they were meant to be what could only be found in who God is. You see, God, not a place, was the destination of the liberated people. For this reason, God says, I brought you out of Egypt so I could bring you to myself. God's desire was to restore his people to fellowship with him. But in order for God to bring the children of Israel 
to himself, he had to first reveal himself. And do you know what comes immediately after Exodus 19? Someone add up the math. Exodus 20. In both Exodus 19 and 20, the scene is set as God speaks to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. This is when God gives the Ten Commandments, and the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to reveal who God is. The purpose is to bring the people to himself by revealing who he is. And the Ten Commandments do this because the Ten Commandments are a transcript. They are a copy of God's character. God is love. Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments as being about love. Love your God, the Lord, your Father. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if God is love and the Ten Commandments are love, then the Ten Commandments are an expression of who God is. And this means that when we look at the law, we're looking at a picture of God himself. When we look at the Ten Commandments and we judge ourselves by them, we see the extent to which our lives are aligned with his life. As we are made into the image of Christ, we will keep his commandments. God did everything he could to establish the permanent binding nature of the Decalogue for all time. God spoke the Ten Commandments with his own lips, thundering it from the mountaintop in the hearing of all Israel. He wrote the commandments by himself with his own finger, not on parchment, not in sand, but graven into stone, chiseled into rock to be a permanent reminder as to who he is and his character. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. The fourth commandment reads, we've read it before, we'll read it again, and the junior Sabbath school class will memorize this text by the end of this series. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. More than any of the other Ten Commandments, if you read the Ten Commandments, all the other ones, a lot of them are just very short. But the Sabbath tells a story, a story about a God who does not change. He always has and always will be the same God of love who in the beginning created the heaven and the earth and then set aside time just to be with us. Sabbath keeping is an act of creation keeping. And it's no wonder that God begins the commandment saying, remember. It clearly implies that the children of Israel are already well acquainted with the Sabbath. This is not a new invention or a novelty. It goes all the way back to the beginning when God created the earth, when he gave it as a gift to Adam and Eve for all humankind. From creation to the Ten Commandments, the seventh-day Sabbath never really disappeared, but it does experience a renaissance. The word remember clearly signifies a recollection of something before, and it also signifies that it's important not to forget. If my wife tells me, don't forget, remember to take out the trash, it's because she knows I might forget. But it is important to her that I don't forget those stinky diapers, and so she tells me, remember. Or she might say, remember, my birthday is coming up, and if I were to forget, what would that say about the relationship? Would it not convey that I don't care for her as I should? In the same way, what message would it say if the very command that God starts by saying, remember, is the only command we choose to willingly forget? What would that say about our relationship with him? You see, the seventh-day Sabbath means something to God. The seventh day of the week from sundown Friday to Sunday, sundown Saturday is special time. That is to say, it's not like any other time. Not because the time itself is different, but because of what it symbolizes, the seventh day is God's flag. It's like a marriage certificate or a wedding ring. I might look at my marriage certificate and say, Psh, ah, it's just a piece of paper. Or I might look at my ring and say, ah, it's just a bit of metal. But can you believe my wife will take notice if I take out the marriage certificate when we get home and burn it? She will take notice if I throw my ring in the trash, and the seventh-day Sabbath is precisely that kind of symbol to God. Indeed, God calls it a sign. He says, you will keep my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. 
The Sabbath is a sign that you are not holy by any good work that you do. The Sabbath is a sign that you are made holy only by the grace of God through faith in Christ's blood and righteousness. You see, the Seventh-day Sabbath is a sign of salvation by grace through faith long before Martin Luther ever coined the term. God says, when you rest on the Seventh-day Sabbath, not doing your work, but resting in my presence and in my word, it is a sign that I am the one who makes you holy. In this way, the Sabbath offers us a center other than ourselves. If the core and first acting principle of sin is selfishness and placing self at the center, then the Sabbath is the sign of principled selflessness, of depending on God and not on self. In verse 16, the Sabbath is called a perpetual covenant. And then again in verse 17, God says it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Remember though, that as the fourth commandment says, the Sabbath did not begin at Mount Sinai but at creation. This means that the Sabbath is a gift to all humankind, not only to the Jews. Some people will look at this and say, well, well, look, isn't that just for the Jews? But while he is making clear that as the Israelites obey God's Sabbath, the day which God set apart, they will become a people set apart in order to know God and make him known. Yet what he's really saying is that if we would also choose to honor God's flag and keep the Seventh-day Sabbath today, then we would likewise become a holy priesthood set apart by God for good works. Don't you see? The Seventh-day Sabbath is a sign that the creator of heaven and earth is our God and that we are his people. The Seventh-day Sabbath is God's flag. In 1861, Henry Ward Beecher spoke about the American flag. And he said, our flag carries American ideas, American history, and American feelings. It is not a painted rag. It is not a painted rag. It is a whole national history. It is the Constitution. It is the government. It is the emblem of the sovereignty of the people. It is the nation. The founding fathers of the United States of America, acting in conformity with international convention, chose a piece of cloth to serve as the national symbol. God, however, acting independently of any known convention, did not choose a place or an object to serve as his special sign. The raw material of the biblical sign is a portion of time. The Seventh-day Sabbath is a cathedral in time. It is cut from the invisible cloth of time and built into an inveritable palace of time. By weaving the Sabbath sign into the web of life, the Sabbath creates a bond between human beings and their creator that is as enduring as God himself. The Sabbath permeates every day of the week. The Bible refers to the first day and the second day and the third day, but only the seventh day gets a name, which is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is more than just a day of stopping from labor. It is an actual sign of relationship between God and his people. It is the memorial of creation. It is the witness of his love. It is the declaration of independence for our freedom in Christ. The Sabbath is God's flag. Understandably then, the one who violates the Sabbath commits an offense that involves more than merely some technicality. The violator of the Sabbath turns his back not just on the symbol, but on the entire reality for which that symbol stands. Violating the Sabbath is less like committing a petty crime and more like committing treason. As the Old Testament scholar John Durham puts it, disregard for the Sabbath either by neglect or by a violation of the strictures concerning it is disregard for Yahweh. And disregard for Yahweh is disregard for the reason and the possibility of existence. Therefore, the sign has to be carefully guarded. As far as God is concerned, if you violate God's Sabbath, you are already set on such a fatal course that great lengths should be taken to ensure that no one else will follow your bad example. And this is why God instructed that violators of the Sabbath commandment were to be put to death. It was like a giant flashing warning sign. God was saying, if you take no thought for, a, for the sign, you are walking yourself off a cliff. 
Interestingly, the language used in this text is identical to that which is found in Genesis when God first warned Adam and Eve about sin. God cautioned them, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Then in Exodus, God says, whoever does work on the Sabbath day will be put to death. Only the Hebrew phrase in both passages is the same. You will certainly be caused to die. In other words, God is not nearly so much concerned with executing punishment by commanding that Sabbath breakers be killed, but rather, God is concerned that a sufficient warning be given to prevent people from suffering the final judgment of eternal death. Didn't Jesus say, don't worry about him who can burn the body, worry about him who can kill both the body and soul in hell? God, as the creator, is the only source of life. And when we turn our back on the Sabbath, it is as if we're turning our backs on him, the result of which will be eventual death. If we separate ourselves from the source of life, we will eventually die. So, God instructed the Sabbath to be observed on penalty of death, to save many from the severity of eternal death, which would eventually follow those who reject the Seventh-day Sabbath flag and everything it stands for. Of course, some have struggled to see this. In his book entitled The End of Faith, the popular atheist Sam Harris argues precisely on this text in Exodus that we just read, that he says the Sabbath is the very opposite of freedom. He then uses this text to malign God's character, belittling the idea that a loving God could actually allow people to be stoned to death for breaking something he says as silly as the Sabbath. But Sam Harris has evidently never been to Norway. Once when our family was visiting some friends of Norwegian heritage, fitting for their cultural roots, they had a, a giant stove in the middle of the family room. They would put in actual wood to heat the whole family room. And if you've ever seen a stove like that, you can imagine it can get really hot. So with our young children and our family coming into their home, it was obviously an accident waiting to happen. But from the moment we walked to the room, our hosts took us to that stove and were very direct with our children. Do not touch this. This will be a big owie, big, big, big owie. They explained that in Norway, to prevent children from being badly burned, the parents would take a child's hand, take their finger, and press it against the stove. And you might think, what a horrible thing to do! Why would they burn their own child? How could a loving parent do such a thing? Are parents in Norway cruel? But the Norwegian parent would argue that they are the loving ones. In fact, they would argue that to give a child a minor burn is the most loving thing to do because the child learns the true danger of touching their hand on the stove so that when they're nearby, they're careful not to do it again. And better a minor burn than the child rubbing their hands on it or, or putting their face on it and doing permanent damage. Thus, as a preventative measure, a, pa a parent's love will give the child a taste of the danger involved in touching the stove. The stove, excuse me. In the same way, God placed a death penalty on those who would violate his seventh-day Sabbath as a way to communicate to our feeble minds just how important this sign is to him. It is a warning of the consequences of eternal death that await those who turn their back on him and his sign. Don't ever let someone suggest to you that breaking the Sabbath isn't a big deal. The seventh-day Sabbath is a sign of love and loyalty toward God. It's God's flag. And if we appreciate the context of Mount Sinai, seeing a people come from slavery to liberty, the, given the Ten Commandments, and then told about the seventh-day Sabbath, we realize that it's also about freedom. They are as much a gift from God as is freedom itself. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, they couldn't worship God. But God said, let them go so that they may worship me. Now they come out and the commandments are given to the people so that they know who God is and they know what he's like and they can experience freedom to worship him and to follow him. The Ten Commandments are about freedom to live a life that honors God and is pleasing to him. Moses sums it up beautifully. He said, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving to you today for your 
own good. Isn't that the crux of the issue? Sometimes we doubt if God's commands are really for our own good. Satan is always ready to tempt us into thinking that somehow God is restricting you. This is exactly what he did from the very beginning to malign God's character. When he was talking to Adam and Eve and he told them, oh, he's holding back that tree from you. It's good for you, but he's holding it back. But nothing could be farther from the truth. All God's commands are for our benefit. God never asks anything from us that is not in our own best interest to do if we would see it from the broader perspective. God is love. And he loves us so much that he gives us the freedom to choose to do what is best. The Ten Commandments are not the burdensome commands of a tyrant, but the, the freeing call of a liberator. And the Sabbath is no different. For too long, too many of us have seen the Sabbath as something that God takes away from us, an interruption to our schedule, or a distraction from whatever it is we would rather be doing. But the seventh-day Sabbath isn't a day that God is taking away from us. It's a day he's giving us, a freedom we are enjoying to put everything else aside and to experience the pursuit of the deepest possible intimacy with him. If we ever see the Sabbath as a day of restriction rather than freedom, we need to plead with God to change our perspective and align it with his because we're already on the enemy's ground. When we love the Lord as it is our privilege to love him, we will find greater joy in being with him than anything else in this world. If you don't like the Sabbath, what's heaven going to be like? It's a day set aside just to delight in him. It won't be a cursed Sabbath. It won't be a burdensome Sabbath. It'll be a happy Sabbath. God is love. He wants what is best for us. He knows what's best for us better than we do. Notice the experience of the Apostle John. And this is love that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. How could John say this? What about David? And he said, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It's more to be desired than gold, even sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. If this is not your experience, then pray to God. Ask him to help you see how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. Ask him to help you see how everything he asks is actually for your own benefit. If your Sabbath experience is stale, ask God for a fresh experience with his holy day. In Deuteronomy, the retelling of the fourth commandment, Moses makes very clear as he goes through it, he comes to the end and he says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Notice how Moses accentuates the meaning of the seventh day as freedom, specifically redemption. Moses says, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. You had to work 24-7. You couldn't keep the Sabbath. Not only that, you knew next to nothing about the God who loves you so much, but he pursued you, he loved you, and he brought you out of that captivity and bondage and slavery by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He brought you out, showed him himself, therefore keep the Sabbath day. Notice God gave the Ten Commandments after he already saved them out of Egypt and not before. They are not commanded to observe the Sabbath as a way to earn salvation, but as a response to the salvation already given by grace. And this emphasis on freedom wasn't just for the Israelites, it's for every single human being who has to live in a world of sin. The first Sabbath at creation was before the fall. It was in a perfect world. Therefore, the redemptive meaning of the seventh day had not yet been revealed. But now Moses makes clear that just as surely as the seventh-day Sabbath is a sign of God's power at creation and his love for humanity, even so, it is a sign of his power to save. Are you grateful for the saving power of Jesus this morning? Hallelujah. The seventh-day Sabbath is his sign. And when we rest on that day, when we make that a special day to commune with him, it is a sign that we are grateful for the work he did for us on Calvary's cross. After all, we were also slaves, not in literal Egypt, but we were slaves to sin. But Jesus Christ has set us free, and this is what the fourth commandment is all about, freedom written in stone, freedom as a weekly reminder of the cross. Perhaps there's someone here this morning who would like to say, I have seen the seventh-day Sabbath in a new light this morning. 
Perhaps there's someone here this morning who came to church as part of a stale Saturday morning routine. But this morning, you want to plead with God to give you a fresh Sabbath experience. If that's you, I want you to stand. Perhaps there's someone else here this morning who realizes that they've been dealing dangerously with God's sign. Maybe it hit you this morning that the seventh day is God's flag and you've been walking all over it. Maybe you've been treating it as a day for sleeping and relaxing, but you haven't been realizing the full potential of the day by using that time to connect with your Redeemer. If that's you, I want you to stand. You've been convicted that you ought to keep the Sabbath in a greater way than you've been doing. The Holy Spirit's convicted your heart that your love for Jesus means you must take his holy day seriously. If that's you, stand. Perhaps there's someone here today who's been convicted they need to see the Sabbath as freedom. Maybe you haven't admitted it to anybody, but secretly inside your experience has been to see the Sabbath as a burden. But this morning, praise the Lord, the Holy Ghost has gotten a hold of you and you've seen, your eyes have been opened that you've been looking at it inside and backwards, inside out and backwards. Maybe you realize that God is love and that the Sabbath is the epitome of his gift of love and grace, of freedom and forgiveness. If that's you, stand. Maybe there's someone here today who just wants to say, thank you, Jesus. I love your Sabbath. If that's you, I invite you also to stand. And if we would all stand now, let's sing our closing hymn, We Love Thy Sabbath, God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the gift of the Sabbath. Now bless your people, and as they endeavor to meet you on this day of sacred time, would you condescend to be very near to them. Bless them also in the week ahead, and bring us back here to enjoy your Sabbath day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.